Hi, I'm Max, and today we're going to talk about the sequel to everyone's favorite 2013 game about a broken man voiced by Troy Baker who learns to care about someone else. No, the other one. I marathoned The Last of Us 2 right when it came out. I loved it and immediately went on Twitter to see what other people thought and found myself to be in the minority, at least of those who were the most vocal. I do agree with and appreciate much of the criticism of the game, but I also found a lot of it to be wildly off base. And for this video, I want to do my best to rebuff those specific criticisms, explore what meaning I personally found in the game, and look at how that meaning might apply to the real world, including some of the criticism levied at the game. Some disclaimers going in. One, I'm going to spoil both Last of Us games. Two, this video is going to include depictions of violence, homophobia, and PTSD, as well as discussions of transphobia and systemic racism. The Last of Us Part Two is often criticized for judgmentally wagging its finger at the player. They're like, oh, the game is like, I, I kill a dog in one second and I pet the dog, so the game is like wagging its finger at me. Which does sound awful. I'd hate that game, but that's not the game I played. The game that I played was not interested in making moral judgments at all. It was interested in the stories people tell themselves to prove that they are the good guy, and how our deepest motivations are not rational but based almost entirely on emotion. A great example of an emotionally charged action like this is the one that the entirety of the first game built toward. In The Last of Us Part 1, we play as Joel and almost immediately see him lose his daughter on the day of a zombie outbreak. We then jump forward 20 years, and the rest of the story sees Joel escorting Ellie, a girl immune to the virus, across the country to some rebels called the Fireflies. The Fireflies want to use Ellie to make a vaccine. As we play, it becomes clear that Joel has hardened himself and done awful things to survive, closing off the world so nothing can hurt him as much as the death of his daughter. As the journey progresses, though, Joel begins to find Ellie filling the hole in his heart. Right before Ellie and Joel reach the Fireflies, Ellie nearly drowns and a spooked Firefly knocks out Joel as he is trying to resuscitate her. Joel wakes up to learn that Ellie will be operated on to produce a vaccine for the virus, but the procedure will kill her. Joel decides he will not let this happen. To free Ellie, he kills dozens of Fireflies, including the only doctor capable of making a vaccine. He then lies to Ellie about what happened. She appears to believe him, though with clear hesitation. He believed that her death could produce a cure, and that Ellie would want to give her life for it if she could. The opening of the second game confirms both these things. They were actually going to make a cure. She needed her immunity to mean something. I told her her immunity meant nothing. What I'm getting at is that Joel could have told himself a story for why he was the good guy here. Say, the Firefly cure wouldn't have worked, or that Ellie wouldn't have wanted this. But he doesn't even try. He knows this decision was not about right and wrong, but about how strong his love for Ellie was. This motivation worked for many players, and it works for Joel's brother Tommy when Joel confesses to him. I can't say I'd have done different. Joel doesn't attempt to construct a narrative around why his actions were right. He knows his actions are entirely emotionally motivated. He's the only character I'm going to analyze in this video, though, where this will be the case. For everyone else, I'll be using this same framework on screen to explore both the story they tell themselves about why they're the good guy, and the emotions that are really driving them. Though, going into the sequel, most players expected Naughty Dog to build an emotional motivation, like in the first game, that patiently developed the relationship between two people in a lonely world. So at the beginning of The Last of Us Part Two, Joel is beaten to death by some of the surviving fireflies from the first game. It's not outright stated, but like, you know it's probably them. Or at least you know when the game starts that anyone who wants to kill Joel probably has a good reason to. So, uh, you kill a lot of innocent people? <sighs> I'll take that as a yes. The setup to Joel's death happens partially from the perspective of a new character named Abby, who's staying in a cabin just outside of Joel's new settled town of Jackson. Now when I played this, I interpreted this line, Assuming he's in there, how do we get to him? To be referring to Joel and have this realization of, oh my god, I totally understand why someone would want to kill this man, and I can't fault this woman for it, but I really don't want her to succeed. The inner conflict I felt here was one of my highlights of the game. It was the first of many tastes of the conflict between loving a character and finding their actions to be worthy of revenge. In an extremely convenient turn of events, Abby is saved from a zombie horde by Joel and Tommy. She convinces Joel and Tommy to take shelter back where her group has set up camp. When they arrive, she turns on them and eventually beats Joel to death but not before Ellie shows up just in time to be scarred by it. I've heard a lot of people criticize the circumstances surrounding Joel's death. Tommy introduces himself and Joel to Abby by name very quickly after meeting her. I'm Tommy, that's Joel. 
This strikes people as off because they'd expect Joel to be like the Joel from the first game who's untrusting and that both him and his brother would be on high alert worried about fireflies looking for retribution. I do have my justification for why Joel and Tommy might act like this within the world of the game. It seems this isn't an uncommon occurrence for Joel and Tommy to just run into folks passing through. That's four years of having lived in this community that's safe. Four years of like, they meet people on the outside all the time and they bring them in. We have all these notes and stuff. These guys are not hunters. Like Joel's looking for hunters. These are regular people, um, just like the people that live in Jackson. Uh, and Joel has become a regular person that lives in Jackson as well. Jackson is a place that people visit very frequently, and the fact that we don't see other interactions like this isn't an example of sloppy writing, but an example of the game not wasting your time with needless filler. It's still possible that Joel might have been on higher alert. I agree the whole thing's a bit contrived, but that's not really what was ever important, which is, yes, Joel is more trusting of other humans than he used to be. There's a specific moment specific moment in that scene the thought that joel has is, this is what happens when you drop your guard I allowed myself to trust i allowed myself to love I allowed myself to feel i allowed myself to be safe and this is what you get it's a moment of regret even inside that moment he goes do it all over again because what i got was the girl the point of the first game is that Joel's rough exterior was a product of the pain caused by losing his daughter. Once Ellie filled that role in his life, he could drop some of his tougher tendencies. You see this when he playfully pushes Ellie into the water. You see it when she runs away and his first reaction isn't to yell at her, but to tell her she can confide in him if she needs to. You talk to me. And you see it in Joel's house, where it's clear he just spent his free time whittling animal sculptures and making guitars. The first time you see this dude in this game after a four year time jump is him helping someone up. Just this shot right here is so intentional, the fact that this is the first time you see him. This shot's doing so much work to tell you how Joel's changed and what a different person he is right now. That, I don't know, to me this is super strong storytelling and all the criticisms that are like, why, why don't we get to see him interact with other survivors in Jackson? Why don't we get more development of him? It's it's because this is doing it. This is the development, and it's so economical and effectively using its time. I just I, I love it. It's great, and I'm upset that particularly to me a lot of the criticisms of this development of his character just seem like people asking for the game to be made worse and more meandering in a game that's already a little longer than it needs to be. None of this is inconsistent writing. It's playing off of the most clear character change Joel went through in the first game. It also makes his death scene a lot more tragic. Joel's death is an incredibly powerful motivator, and it only works if it happens at the beginning of the game. The Last of Us Part II requires you to have played the first game to get the full emotional experience. Killing Joel off creates emotions in a player that any first game in a series would struggle to conjure up in its first act. We wanted to make a scene that would disturb us. And I think wherever you fall on the spectrum on how good this game was, he succeeded at least at that. Okay, the scene works. On one level, it's like, <laughs> it's like it did what it meant to do. The rest of the game would not work as well without this deep emotional motivation. You going with her? Ellie now sets out on a journey with her girlfriend Dina, later being joined by both Tommy and Dina's ex-boyfriend Jesse, to track down and kill all eight people from the party that Abby was a part of when she murdered Joel. This takes them to Seattle in search of the Washington Liberation Front, the gang they believe Abby belonged to. This part, the tracking down and killing part, is, from what I gather, pretty popular with people who swear this game is the worst thing since the Three Beams of Light. The first 15 hours or so are somewhat enjoyable. There are graphic scenes of your horse dying, and overabundance of brutality and gore, but narratively speaking, it seems understandable. What's really interesting about this game is that at the start, we spend the first 10 hours of the game trying to track down and seek revenge on every single person that helped murder Joel. And as a player, I think we can all respect that. A lot of people playing this game really want each of these fuckers dead and talk about how satisfying it is to kill them. For this subset of people, the disgust generated from Joel's death worked and Ellie's motivations were believable. I'm not here to defend whether these actions by Ellie are believable or not over the top. It didn't entirely work for me, so if it didn't work for you, I feel ya. 
One not entirely negative reason I think that people might find Ellie's killing more troublesome than Joel's in the original is that you don't actually kill another human till like five or six hours in. There's a lot more weight given to killing in this game than the first one where you kill someone in what's basically a tutorial. I haven't seen as much attention paid to this as giving all the human enemies names <laughs> or making their deaths really brutally animated. And I think that speaks to its effectiveness as a subtle choice. Still, any game that needs to have challenging and entertaining combat with multiple human enemies over a long runtime is going to turn its protagonist into a bit of a psychopath, and maybe that's a larger conversation than just this game. Honestly, my biggest complaint in this section is its super repetitive gameplay. Oh yay, another segment where I duck in and out of buildings to flank human and canine enemies. Whoa. Even if I don't fully buy everything, I do enjoy how the game tests how far the player will go and still root for Ellie. Perhaps the Washington Liberation Front Wolves. Whatever. Isn't such pure evil that deserves to be mass murdered. After fighting their way through many infected parts of Seattle, Dina and Ellie discover that the wolves are much bigger than the small group in Jackson, and it seems as though there are dozens or hundreds of them. Though they attack on sight, certain things bother Dina and Jesse. Something keeps bugging me. Why didn't they kill you and Tommy when they had the chance? I don't know. Could be that you just weren't who they were looking for. So they let you go. Joel's done bad things. Maybe they had a good reason. That changed anything for you? Nope. But it's repeatedly mentioned that the wolves aren't like the people of Jackson. I can't believe they just attacked like that. These people are not like us. This place isn't like Jackson. I mean, Joel and Tommy helped Abby when she got attacked. These people are trying to kill everyone around them. And Ellie bats away any suggestion that they might not be entirely deserving of violence. Yeah, but why do you think that they didn't finish it the- It doesn't matter. They fucked up. Starting to draw parallels between her people and the wolves might prevent Ellie from justifying her actions. The people around Ellie clearly start to see that something isn't quite right with her. She didn't hurt Joel. It would have been pretty fucked up to make her talk. She traveled hundreds of miles to torture him. I don't care whether she held the club or not. If those fuckers who killed Joel got taken out by some random infected, then they'd still be dead, Ellie. I really hope you make it. But the player can hold on to one thing in her defense. Ellie doesn't know the real reason that Joel was killed. Or does she? About halfway through this stretch of revenge, Ellie corners Nora, one of her many targets. Nora knows who Ellie is. You have breathing spores. Her. And gives a certainty once and for all that these are ex-fireflies. There are no fireflies anymore. This conversation also finally makes clear to Ellie what Joel did. But this doesn't change anything for her, and Ellie tortures Nora to figure out where to look next for Abby. After this, we find out that Ellie ran away to go to the Firefly Hospital two years prior and learned everything that Joel had done. She didn't react well at the time. Oh my god. Ellie has known what Joel did this whole time. Don't you fucking touch me! And even assumed that these are the Fireflies getting revenge. One of her journal articles expresses this and shows how even she doesn't understand why she's doing this. Her rationale, her story for why she's good isn't driving her. It's some primal instinct drawn from the pain of losing Joel. And she keeps going. She doesn't find Abby, but instead kills Abby's friend Owen and his pregnant girlfriend Mel as Ellie attempts to get them to give her info on Abby, failing miserably. She only decides to pack up and return home because Dina is pregnant with Jesse's baby and she doesn't want to put them at risk for her revenge. That's when a really pissed off Abby shows up, gets the drop on Tommy, shoots Jesse in the face, and gets Ellie to disarm by threatening to kill Tommy. We're then faced with Abby, a character who has so many good reasons to kill Ellie, the character who we've been led to love more than any other in the game. And now a really controversial thing happens. We're thrust into Abby's shoes and flash back a full four years earlier in her life. Again, I'm not trying to say everything in this game needs to be perfect. I 
get why even people who don't mind playing as Abby don't like the structure and wish her story had been more interspersed with the rest of the game, but it worked for me. Her whole story has added tension because we care that the Abby we meet in the theater isn't the same Abby who killed Joel for revenge months prior. Ellie's life hangs in the balance, and even if you don't believe they'd kill her off, Tommy and Dina's life are very realistically in jeopardy. You find out that Abby is the daughter of the doctor that Joel kills to save Ellie. We're given enough information to understand that these two have an important and close relationship. T, I've got my little girl to keep me safe. With one particular parallel to Ellie and Joel's scenes. You'll be back with Owen before you know it. Wait, what? Nothing. Just noticed you two have been hanging out a lot. More so than usual. Oh, God. I hear the way Jesse talks about you. No, Jesse and I are just friends. <laughs> no, 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 I've got a pretty keen eye for these sort of things. Not so keen with this one. Abby's dad, Jerry, is even a lot more on point. How long have you known? I'm your dad. I see things. I'm not into your type. What, Asians? Yeah, that's obviously what I meant. We learn enough to know that Abby and her dad care about each other, and that's all we really need. We're not supposed to care about Abby's dad as much as Joel, but it cements that we probably don't have a rational reason to think of Abby as a villain for wanting to inflict pain on someone who has taken a loved one away, especially not in the world we've been exploring where characters we love do exactly that. Then we get a long scene back in the present day, exploring what being a wolf is like and how developed their society is. You see that they have a school with the same daily schedule as in Jackson, they have stores, we get a parallel with an arming up to go on patrol scene, and we get to pet a dog. The dog in particular gets a lot of flack for being manipulative because of how Ellie interacts with this dog. Oh, hey there, bear. But it just didn't hit me that way, because the sheer scale of the Wolves stadium base drove home the point that, yes, this place is like Jackson. Ladies first. first. I don't think this game is trying to make you feel bad. The game is not making any judgments. The game is just presenting, here are some acts, and here's another view on the same acts. You make with it what you will. If anything, this tore back all of my feelings and just made me go a little more into logic brain mode for a second. It made me look at all the excuses I'd been making to morally justify Ellie's actions and found that they're all nothing, or at the very least, their immorality still applies to characters I liked as well. The story moving forward continues to tear down bogus rationalizations. We follow Abby through a bit of the Wolves' war with the Seraphites, a cult organized around a deceased doomsday prepper who forgo modern technology and kill captured enemy combatants by hanging and gutting them. This also explains why Ellie and Dina were attacked on sight. That and the fact that a random stranger had just killed a bunch of their people. Tommy did this. It's true that the wolves aren't entirely like the people of Jackson, but maybe because they're at war? But were that it were so simple. It's established early on in Ellie's story that the wolves took power from government remnant forces, usually referred to as Fedra. Fedra soldiers. Check out that wall. They were executed. In retaliation for the way the government repressed civilians and imposed martial law. Idiots. Just turning everyone against you. Then, the wolves turned around and became their own kind of oppressors. Seattle traded one shitty ruler for another. Executing people for crimes as small as graffiti, and creating many enemies for themselves. Even life fighting with the wolves is not the greatest, as you meet a group of deserters who attack Ellie on sight. We're not going by, understand? Terrified that she is a wolf who has come to take them back to Isaac, their leader. Isaac can go to hell! Isaac might lend a bit of an explanation to the hurt behind the acts the wolves commit. One note in the early game details how Isaac's compatriots were tracked down and killed by the government relief forces, perhaps hinting that his ruthless rule is built from a loss of close friends. While the Seraphites are clearly very bad, their actions are maybe not much worse than the wolves. It's made clear that the wolves' rise to power was rough and many people were searching for any alternative that might give them security. It must have been scary for all these people. First the outbreak, then Fedra, then the wolves. It's also made clear through notes that while there are no Seraphites who join the wolves, many wolves do defect and join the Seraphites. It's also detailed that the Seraphites' trauma and rise in violence was set off by Isaac's killing of their prophet. We weren't stoning or hanging people until after she died. They're taking her words and 
twisting them. Isaac. Fuck. You turned a crazy person into a martyr. The Seraphites are a pure embodiment of our basic tendency to see ourselves as good no matter what. To achieve this, the Seraphites adopt some really weird and destructive beliefs, but in a complicated world where everything has gone to shit, any narrative that tells you you are good is reassuring, especially when it comes with the emotional compatriarchy of people who have been bonded by mutual hurt. Yeah, I know, I made up a word, but I like how it sounds, and you know what I meant, so I'm keeping it. The Seraphite-Wolf conflict is incredibly rich, and illustrates at a large scale what the game does on a small scale with Abby and Ellie. When it comes to complicated conflicts, who you side with often has more to do with who you care about than who might be objectively in the right. Let's take a real world example. The Vietnam War, as seen here, portrayed with 100% unbiased historical accuracy in Call of Duty Black Ops. And I'm sorry, this is gonna work mostly for Americans or folks from American allied countries. How much do you personally know about why we were in that war and why we were the good guys? Sure, some of you probably know a lot about the conflict, but for most of us it's something like, I don't know, there was a boat that might have been shot at, and national security, cold war, dominoes, something something. And even among people who maintain that the war was unjustified and unnecessary, there's still a pretty strong sense that the forces fighting the Americans in Vietnam were bad. If America is criticized for its action, it's usually for the unnecessary loss of American life, without considering the loss of Vietnamese life. My point here isn't to say you need to come to the conclusion that the American invasion of Vietnam was a bad thing that we did, even though I 100% think that it was. Like the game, I'm less concerned with casting moral judgments than I am with looking at thought processes. My guess is that most of us came to the conclusions we have about the Vietnam War based not on extensive research, but the beliefs and attitudes of people we trust, and possibly the personal experiences of people People we love who experienced the war firsthand from the American side. I'm assuming most gamers aren't old enough to have fought in that war, but maybe I'm wrong. Or perhaps the fact that coming to an alternative conclusion would mean telling ourselves a story in which we were definitely not the good guy. With regards to The Last of Us Part 2, the game's director said that it was partially inspired by his own lived experience growing up in the West Bank. None of this is to say that we cannot rationally determine what is right or wrong. Needless killing is wrong, whether it's done by video game characters or the US government. When I say that this game is not interested in moral judgments, I am not saying that we cannot make them. I am saying that this game is more interested in examining the forces that might make it very hard for us to make them in the moment. I don't want you to think bad of Tommy. Ellie, if I had my sister's killers tied to a chair, I'd do worse. I'm also not making a facts don't care about your feelings argument. More that feelings can cause you to only consider the facts that make you feel good. It doesn't matter. They fucked up. Abby's personal story involves her learning to move beyond the use of violence to process her emotional pain. She goes AWOL to check on her friend and ex-boyfriend Owen. Along the way, she is saved from becoming a human piñata by two runaway Seraphites, Yara and Lev. She helps them avoid getting eaten by zombies or killed by their former tribe mates, but leaves them to fend for themselves as Yara rests an arm the Seraphites pulverized. Abby finds Owen and discovers he doesn't want to fight anymore. After an argument, we get a really misguided sex scene. <laughs> There's a dream sequence where Abby is back in the hospital where she found her dad dead, but in the dream she sees Yara and Lev hanging from trees, gutted in the typical Seraphite fashion. Recognizing the value of their life that transcends the conflict, she decides to save them and spends almost the rest of the story focusing on this relationship. There's some really believable bonding in Abby's section that cuts through a lot of the rest of the game's ugliness. Oh fuck these scars. Seraphites, whatever. Yeah. Oh, Never heard a Seraphite cuss before. It was my first time. Where's California? Okay, so look, uh, this is Seattle, and this is Santa Barbara. Can we take a minute and be impressed by me? Not yet. <laughs> Left, come here, I'm gonna hug you. One of my favorite scenes is one in which Yara plays fetch with Abby's dog, Alice. She's not going to bite, right? Nope. I promise. It feels really profound because the last time we saw a Seraphite interacting with a dog, they were being mauled. And now they're just playing fetch together. It highlights how meaningless human conflict often is and how good we can be deep down. I see this get written off as another scene kind of rubbing your face and the fact that Ellie later kills this dog, but I really didn't think that was the point and it's kind of a shame this scene gets read that way. 
I thought it was swell. This section is also where the developers bothered to put all the varied gameplay sections with really fun environments to navigate through. My highlight was a segment where you have to avoid Tommy as a sniper as you fight infected. Like it's so frustrating on survivor difficulty and you start to hate Tommy a little bit and it's cool that the game manages to use its gameplay to achieve that. Coupled with the fact that Tommy killed my favorite character from this section. This is so much better than getting drunk and watching anime. What? Nothing. It was the only time I really actually started to root for Abby above Ellie and all her friends. At the climax of Abby's story, she, Lev, and Yara wind up on the Seraphite Island and watch Isaac attempt to commit a genocide to end the war. Yara is wounded by a soldier who shoots her without a second thought, and Abby puts herself between Lev and Isaac, risking her own life before Yara goes out in a blaze of glory shooting Isaac in the back. Abby and Lev then have to fight through wolves and Seraphites to survive, in the process, seeing the absolute destruction brought to the Seraphite Island and how many wolves die in the process. I think it's fucking dead. Anyone else go off the island? Echo, you're the first to call in. No one from the other unit. Jesus Christ, where the fuck was the backup? Abby is then left only with Lev. And Owen and Mel, too, but... you know. Of course she finds them, and then it's Ellie murder in time. Because Ellie left behind her map, pointing right to her location. Yeah, again, this game's not perfect. Going into this fight, a lot of people still really hated Abby, so I think it's important to look at some of the arguments for how Abby is the Antichrist compared to Ellie, and how little they hold up to scrutiny. Number one, Abby kills Joel brutally. No! So yeah, she kills a dude who wasn't a threat and travels to do it. Though, as we now know, this guy killed her father, and if you don't think a character can be likable despite this, we need to talk about Ellie's rampage to kill people who clearly left her alive. In a scene I glossed over earlier, it's revealed that most of the wolves, except for Owen, wanted to kill Ellie and Tommy to tie up dangerous loose ends, a thing they were rightfully worried about, and Abby was the deciding voice in not killing them. We're done. Number two. Oh, Abby kills plenty of scars. Seraphites. Yeah, I was gonna... Say that. Yes, she kills people in a war, people who have probably shot, hung, and flayed several of her friends. If we can justify liking Joel despite his dark past robbing people selfishly in raids, using their kindness against them... How did you know? No what? About the ambush. I've been on both sides. It doesn't seem like that much of a stretch to like Abby despite being part of a war. Yes, it's definitely not a good or admirable part of her character, but not one that makes her abnormally psychopathic within the world of these games. Number three, Abby seems to enjoy the killing though. Yes, she at one point expresses a desire to torture Seraphites. After our morning, I wouldn't mind a few minutes with these guys. But Ellie seems to get pleasure from killing wolves. WLF fuckers. Dick. She fucked up a bunch of wolves. You've been impressed. And talks about torture. Just give me five minutes of my knife. I'll tell you if they were lying or not. Oh, wow. Okay. And even engages in it with Nora. There's also a scene of Joel doing the same thing to save Ellie in the first game, and clearly taking some pleasure in it. Remember, this is a game that buys into the fantasy that torture is an effective way to extract valuable information from people. Again, this game is not perfect, even in its political messaging. It's true that Abby has very little respect for Seraphite life in general, but again, dehumanizing your enemy is a theme of this game that Ellie definitely participates in too. You've been impressed. Honestly, I don't have a conclusive feeling on how the game handles this, but it's definitely not a characteristic unique to Abby, and I'm maybe kind of glad that the game doesn't portray war as this gentlemanly competition and bothers to portray how it often devolves into thinking of other people as subhumans. The YouTube channel Three Arrows has a good video on the subject relating to World War I, I'll link it in the description. Number four, Abby kills her own people. Yes, she turns on the wolves as they are massacring people and are about to kill children that she cares about. Also, the wolves are her adopted movement. She wanted to be a firefly and chose this because the fireflies disbanded after Joel killed a bunch of them. Oh, what's that? A dude killing people he was previously aligned with to save a kid that he liked? Huh, funny that. Number five. She shoots Jesse in the face and Tommy in the back of the head. So she was outnumbered in a clearly high-stakes situation against an enemy she'd just seen totally waste a friend of hers, 
just inches from her face. Killing people to stay in control of a deadly situation is, of course, something that Ellie would never do. Number six. Abby does not show any regret for any of this. No! <laughs> oh. Easy. Abby clearly expressed to Levin Yara that she feels she needs to do what she's doing. Why did you come back for us? Guilt. But also, I needed to. I had to. Needed to lighten the load a bit. The dream of them hanging shows some guilt at the way she is able to forget that other's trauma might be as relevant to them as her own is to her. We don't deserve this. We see her change from reading notes from Seraphites to their prophet with contempt. Ooh, someone wants to get laid. To regret as they talk about losing friends to wolves. <sighs> and she even remarks to Owen. What happened to us? You know, clearly because she thinks that everything she's done in her life has been great and perfect and there's nothing she needs to like make up for. I don't know how to thank you. You don't need to. I did it for me. Just because she doesn't completely lose composure the same way that Ellie does doesn't mean she's not having the same feelings. She's a soldier who's been part of one paramilitary organization or another for her entire adult life. She's gonna react a little differently than a teenager who spent the last four years in a cozy mountain village. None of the reasons for why Abby is a worse person than Ellie really hold up that well to scrutiny, but I think there's a much better one. She killed Joel! She beat him to death in front of Ellie and we watched Ellie cry while Abby did it. We hate her, and whatever rationale the game gives for her actually being an understandable person will never outweigh the pain we feel for Joel's loss and the love that we have for Ellie. This is not a moral reason for establishing that Abby is a bad person, but an emotional explanation for how deep many players' hatred of her was. The next scene in the game just made me sit with that. You play as Abby right after she shoots Tommy in the back of the head, as she tries to track down a fleeing Ellie and kill her. Now this scene is incredibly unpopular, but I loved it. I knew I had no good rational reason for rooting for Ellie. I knew I was biased and supporting Ellie because I cared more about her after playing the first game. Playing as Abby forced me to confront that head on. It's the conflict from the end of the first game where the life of someone you care about can mean more to you than the lives of hundreds of people you don't know. It's a powerful statement about love but also an incredibly disturbing one. I don't think Naughty Dog expected anyone was gonna play this scene like, yes, it's time for me to kill the child I've watched grow into a woman and have spent upwards of 30 well-crafted hours with. They knew you'd hate this, even after being given a convincing argument to the contrary. It's a great statement on how emotions and care for other human beings will trump our rationale. Also, it's great to see all the ways that Ellie can kick Abby's ass despite being half her size. Like, the most I grinned in this game is during the scene when Ellie killed me with a trip mine. It's just fun to have your tactics used against you, and it really drives home how good at fighting Ellie has gotten since killing that first raider in part one. Anyway, the fight ends and Abby has the upper hand and almost kills Dina as revenge for Mel's death. She's pregnant. But looking at Lev convinces Abby to spare her. This makes sense because they just watched thousands of people die in fire, and if Lev can become the most important person in Abby's life after being aligned with her mortal enemy, maybe revenge isn't the most important thing to her anymore. Abby decides to not inflict the same pain on Dina and Ellie that they inflicted on her, because she now understands that it won't bring anyone back to life. She made some peace with the death of her father by helping others, where killing Joel gave her none. You see that she doesn't have relief. She realizes in that moment, I don't have relief, but I have to move on. Just look at the way she wakes up when her focus is on revenge or violence versus when she is able to save a life. Dad! <laughs> Sometimes the emotional responses we justify aren't the right ones for not just the people on the other side of them, but us too. So Dina and Ellie survive. They settle in a farmhouse outside of Jackson where Dina has her baby and the three all get to live in a kind of sickly idyllic life that's so hard to square with the game we've been playing for more than 20 hours now. I understand that this feels off to people, but that felt really intentional to me. There's this great scene where Ellie and her baby JJ are sitting on this tractor and Ellie's talking about all the stories she'll tell him when he gets older. 
much older. And as you sit there, watching every blade of grass sway, thinking about how many programmers spent actual nights away from their actual family trying to make this look so detailed, there is an intense feeling of uneasiness. Of course, Ellie has really bad PTSD that keeps her up at night and makes her miserable. We also learn that Tommy survived right before he reveals that he tracked Abby to California and tries to get Ellie to go find her, getting himself kicked out of the house. But Ellie can't shake this. She still has trauma over Joel, and even if she can't justify it, the only thing she has left to follow is her urge to get revenge on Abby. The catalyst for the game's final act is Ellie recalling what we imagine is her last interaction with Joel, after he pushes someone who lobs a slur at her and Dina. What is wrong with you? He had no right. And you do? I don't need your fucking help, Joel. We see his sad eyes, and with this last look, are given some motivation to make one last trip to track down Abby, even if it destroys everything that Ellie has built with Dina and JJ. If there were ever any evidence that this game isn't too concerned with passing moral judgment, other than Druckmann saying as much, The game is not making any judgments on your actions. It's this section. Abby and Lev have been captured by the Rattlers, an incredibly vicious gang who get most of their power from slave labor, who also set a trap that badly injures Ellie, which she only escapes by using her immunity against one of her captors. While there are technically some attempts to humanize the Rattlers, these people are generally vile beyond anyone in the entire series, committing constant atrocities. Come on, come on, you can do it! Just a little closer, buddy! Oh, leave him alone. Uh, I can't feel anything. Oh, fuck that! I promised him I'd do this to him. This is such a fucked up hobby. Bet you wish you didn't try to escape now, don't you, Anthony? And yet, Ellie doesn't treat them differently from any other obstacle. She makes a journal entry where she complains about them alongside the fireflies, wolves, and scars. It doesn't matter that they're slavers, it's just that they're in her way. Ellie does maybe the best thing anyone does in this whole series in this section, by freeing some prisoners who start a revolt. But she does it almost by accident, using them in a fight against a guard. This hugely good act seems of little consequence to her, and she shrugs it off as she limps, bleeding, towards Abby, who's been crucified on the beach. The Abby we encounter here has clearly changed. Before this, there are some touching scenes with Lev. If we find fireflies, we'll celebrate with strawberries. If we don't, we'll console ourselves with strawberries. Maybe there's another way in? Are you being positive? I'm trying to be helpful. You're always helpful. And when she's let down off the pole, even though she sees a woman who has done awful things to her, her first priority is saving this kid she loves so much. As I said, Abby learned to value the things she could save in life over hurting those who'd done her wrong, and it's in everything down to her character model. We see Abby get stronger and stronger throughout time with growing muscles. This not only makes diegetic sense because she lives very close to an actual gym, but also because she's built herself to be a killing machine in a world where she's learned that plenty of people are in need of killing. But when she no longer has the same physical strength, the good in her is still there. She cares about what she can protect more than what she can kill. We also see this in a note she writes to Owen after his death, where, rather than becoming obsessed with killing his killer like with her dad, she's savoring a good memory of them watching a spotted seal. I've glazed over Owen's character details thus far, but I love him. Not just because he's played by Patrick Fugit, who I always like to see getting work after his childhood role in Almost Famous, or not because Owen's some great dude, because he isn't, but because he's just such a friendly prick. Owen is one of the least mean-spirited characters in the game. He's the first to advocate for not killing Ellie and Tommy. It's too risky to leave them alive. Too fucking bad. And is one of the first to tire of bloodshed with the Seraphites. And he's such a goober. Yeah, well, my aquarium, my stuff. I was kidding. Take whatever you want. You can't. But he's also selfish. He cheats on his pregnant wife and repeatedly tries to ditch her to save Abby. He's not a great guy, but in a way where he's not overtly malicious, and I appreciate the nuance in his character. I bring up Owen because of a key scene where he describes why he went AWOL after sparing a Seraphite's life. I hit this one on the head. Hard. And he goes down, and his weapon's right there. And he doesn't go for it. Instead, he turns to me. And he's old. And tired. He was just... Ready. 
He doesn't spare them because of some large moral crusade, as much as because killing takes a toll. I couldn't do it. This theme is throughout the game. You don't think Joel deserved what he got? I think he deserved worse. I just... I just wish I didn't take part in it. Needed to lighten the load a bit. I am tired, Abby. Look at the way Isaac is portrayed. After all these notes building up Isaac as this super ruthless dude, we just see a tired old man who has clearly been worn down by all the violence he's experienced, and just wants to get to an end. This is, in its own way, a selfish act done because Owen realized that killing this Seraphite had nothing to do with anything that would make his life better. And that's where we get to the ending. Ellie follows Abby out to some boats, apparently strongly considering not engaging. Maybe because she's taken aback by Abby's diminished state and change in priorities. Maybe because they needed an excuse for a water fight. Again, not a perfect game. She then forces Abby to fight her by threatening Lev, and after losing a couple of fingers to Abby, she appears to have won. She's gonna kill Abby, and it'll be over. But she doesn't kill Abby. She lets Abby go, and Abby and Lev go off into the fog. I understand the frustration with this game over how Ellie suddenly gains morals when a named character shows up, but I disagree with this framing. This kind of thing happens two times in the game before this, once with Nora and once with Mel. With Nora, it makes sense because of how personal the death is, how much harm Ellie inflicts on one human. For Mel, it's not even the morals of killing a pregnant woman, it's that Ellie's justification melts away when Mel's pregnancy reminds her of Dina. Tommy even helps her rationalize this killing after the fact. They got what they deserved. But she gets to live. Why does Ellie forgive Abby at the end? Because she doesn't. In the instant when she could end Abby's life, she realizes she feels just as terrible as she always has since Joel's death. He will be every bit as gone as he always has been, and killing Abby will achieve nothing. She realizes in that moment, I don't have relief, but I have to move on. <laughs> killing takes a toll, and she won't take it one more time. She lets Abby go, not because she's forgiven her or because she thinks it's some morally righteous act, but because she's learned at some level, that revenge has nothing to do with healing your pain, and is not worth even the slightest amount of trouble it causes. My friends can't get out of their own damn way. It's better. Even though she spares Abby, Ellie still pays a high price. Dina has left, packed up, taken baby JJ and relegated Ellie's possessions to one room no note or anything. Ellie attempts to play guitar, and she can't even do that because she's missing fingers. She then has the last Joel flashback. Turns out she talked to Joel after what we previously thought was their last encounter, and we hear him say this absolutely heartbreaking line. If somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. And Ellie says this. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. This whole time, since I found out Ellie knew what Joel did, I was wondering how we went from this. I'll go back. But we're done. To this. No! 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 <laughs> and I think, after this, for me, the answer is nothing changed. Joel did something that Ellie could not square with her views of what was a good person and it made it nearly impossible for her to stand the cognitive dissonance of being close to him. But I think if he'd been killed the day after she learned that about him, she'd still have done everything the same, because it wasn't about what was right. It was about how much she loved Joel. Her pain was for missing out on a good thing that she never got to have. She didn't get to make up with Joel. She didn't get to have her movie night with him. I was thinking of inviting Joel to watch a movie. Oh. Guys, good? Yeah. But killing was no substitute for that. And now Ellie knows that all she can do is look for the light left in the world that brings her joy. Because that's what the game has always been about.
Yes, Last of Us Part Two is about a trail of revenge, but also a trail of love. Joel loves Ellie and saves her life, killing Jerry. Abby loves Jerry and kills to avenge him. Ellie loves Joel and kills to avenge him. Isaac loves his friends and fights a war against Fedra and then the Seraphites to protect and avenge them. As the Seraphites try and avenge their prophet and their own friends, who they loved and brought light into their life. Both games are about love. Some of the worst atrocities that happen in the world happen in the name of love. And by the end, almost every surviving character has learned to focus on the love rather than the monstrous actions that can be taken in its name. Yes, The Last of Us Part Two is a far darker game than its predecessor, but it's still about the love that can be found between humans and dark times that puts into perspective what is really valuable. The moments of joy and euphoria are still here amidst all the darkness, and for me, the contrast only made them shine all the brighter. It takes a trip through the darkest aspects of humanity to show us that there is still hope and that our salvation can still come from our best instincts. But The Last of Us Part Two really doesn't deliver the same set of feelings as the original. Whatever criticisms there are to make on its merits, the stark difference in emotional impact between the two games is far more undeniable. I think a lot of folks consume media looking to get the same feeling and experiences as other media that came before it. I'm, I'm not talking down to anyone here. I totally sympathize with this and it's taken me more time than I care to admit to fully formulate my thoughts into this video. It's understandable why a lot of people found this game so violently disappointing, but I don't think I'm off base in saying that a lot of the backlash came from the hurt this caused, and a lot of the criticisms were rationales made to justify that after the fact. The backlash to this game was, in microcosm, an example of its strength. A game caused deep pain, as did a character within it and people became angry at it and came up with a lot of reasons that this character must be awful and that Neil Druckmann must be a hack. I don't want to invalidate anyone's opinions, but I find it hard to believe we wouldn't see a few more reviews from people like Jim Sterling and Cosmonaut Variety Hour who don't sing the game's praises at all, but don't have this violent negative reaction to it. There's also people like the Democracy who don't buy into Ellie's motivation and just think all the characters are needlessly cruel, and I don't have a really strong defense against that, but it's not really what I was trying to address with this video. I'm interested in the negative reviews that subscribed to this rigid adherence to black and white morals, that there are good and bad guys, that actions have to be either good or bad and we need to feel bad about the bad ones and lift up the good ones. I don't find that kind of thinking helpful. I made this video because I thought this framing was very common and harmful to how we act. And when I say I thought about it, I mean like this is something that was going around in my head before I played this game, and when I played it I was amazed to see it reflected back in a work of art. I know I've had conflict with people where I find myself looking for reasons why someone else's actions are morally wrong, and even that other people are evil, when often neither of these things are the case. It often results in me changing my opinions to make my story more cohesive rather than changing my actions to make the world better. In my experience, it's more effective to just think about the effects of people's actions and communicate with them rather than coming up with fantasies in your head about why they wouldn't be let through the pearly gates. Rigid, moralistic thinking rarely helps the person experiencing it, and it's certainly unpleasant to be on the other side of. This almost even made this video much worse. I started making this as a blanket defense of both the game and Naughty Dog. My original tone was a lot less attentive to the game's flaws and a lot less critical of its developer. And I also don't want to defend Naughty Dog. They were really bad to their staff in a lot of ways. Yeah, sure, it's cool that Naughty Dog isn't compromising their artistic vision to sell more copies. We've now, we're, we're, we're lucky enough that we've had so much success that there isn't a lot of creative questioning of what we want to do. But the people in charge know that that freedom of creativity hinges on them being able to produce games that sell well on a consistent, timely basis. Just because I don't personally believe that Naughty Dog was making a worse product to exploit their customers doesn't mean it's any better that they were willing to mistreat their workers to avoid doing so. The way Lev's gender is handled is also not great as it kind of comes to define his whole character and a large chunk of the game is about queer people experiencing abuse. There's a great Medium post on this under the name Haruspis, I'm definitely not pronouncing that right, that dissects the game's issues on this subject better than I ever could. While I don't find this game as heavy handed as many do, I can totally see where someone is coming from labeling it trauma porn and it really didn't help that Naughty Dog's review embargo made it impossible for players to know about possible triggers before playing the game. Even though I really liked the game, I can acknowledge that this is a problem. It's both possible, and even necessary, to simultaneously enjoy media while also being critical of its more problematic or pernicious aspects. 
So this isn't my attempt to tell you to buy this game or that Naughty Dog deserves your praise. Just like the game, this video isn't a search for a hero. This is my expression of how this game connected with me on my first playthrough. As sloppy as I can recognize that parts of the game are, it hit me on a really profound level in a way many recent games hadn't, because it spoke to themes that I think are incredibly important to understanding the world around us. I think now, more than ever, is a time where it's incredibly important to recognize the way in which emotions can cause us to buy into harmful narratives and support systems that harm real people. Because there's something that matters far more than rambling about a video game for an hour. Black lives. Racial justice advocates are currently executing one of the largest protest movements against racial injustice in my country's history. And I see some fellow white people going through a lot of the same thought processes I explored in this video to dismiss it completely. You'll hear them say things like, yeah, it's unacceptable to not care about black lives, but I can't respect these protests because they're violent. That's not an argument. It's clinging to the first thing someone can find to stop thinking about an issue that's distressing. Because considering a reality where racial injustice is so painful and destructive that people would be moved to violence is really hard to come to terms with. When they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. There's a social contract that we all have, that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. For white folks, being an ally often requires learning things that cause guilt and feel bad. But that's not the point. The point is to do what you can to ensure the well-being of the human beings that are here on this planet. It's important to look at the stories you've been telling yourself and get educated. I'm currently going through Abolition Journal's Prison Abolition Study Guide. There are a lot of good resources on here from historians and academics of all kinds. And it's all available for free, though the creators suggest that you buy Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. There's also a helpful list of black-owned bookstores to buy it from. You can support people affected by America's prison industrial complex by donating to the Community Bail Fund, which gives money to more than 70 bail funds around the country. You might even find a local one within their directory that you could give to directly. And finally, you can get out there and have a more direct effect on the world, and stand on the front lines against racism and protests that are still going on across the country. Now is not the time to focus on how good we want things to be. It's time to take action to make them better.